And so a lot of people are talking about the NFC North, like, Hey, like we've got two NFC North teams battling in the playoffs. But if you are uh, a little bit old, if you're older than 35, it, it'll actually remind you that we have three teams from the old NFC central. That's right. It's going to be the Packers, the Lions and the Buccaneers. A lot of people don't remember this. The Bears, the Packers, and the Lions were all in the same division with the Minnesota Vikings. And if you ever look back at some like old photos of like Barry Sanders, Walter Payton, there's always some killer photos uh, where they where these running backs are going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to where you're like, God, oh, did they play them a lot? Well, they did because they played twice a year. Remember the old Battle of the Bays? So it's really got a old black and blue division feel to the NFC this week, which is why we're rooting for the 40. I can't handle, I can't handle any one of those three. Now oh, the Buccaneers, not so much the lions and the Packers. I'm not ready for this. And I'm not ready for those two teams to be in the NFC championship, but you know what? We don't have to worry about that. Hopefully the 49ers go out there and take care of their business. But what we're going to do right now is focus on the Chicago bears. We've got a great show lined up for you this evening. So Sammy, why don't we go ahead and get started? Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast with Adam Ray. Trying to cut it back. Justin Fields making magic happen. There goes Fields. Touchdown. The Sickest Chicago Bears and Fantasy Football Podcast. Brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Sports entertainment like no other. It's going to be sick. Sick, sick. It's Wednesday night. You know what that means. It is time for Take It to the Rank, and we'll get you out of here in about an hour. And then I will be on the Tate Never Lies Network at 9 o'clock Eastern. And for those of you who don't follow that, too, you can go watch The Challenge, and you can watch AEW and all that good stuff. We'll get you out of here in plenty of time. But we have Carmen Vitale of FoxSports.com. She'll be here in about ah, 20 to 25 minutes to take more victory laps about her friends in Green Bay and Detroit advancing. In the playoffs, we'll talk about the Bears' interviews at the offensive coordinator position. Uh, but first, uh, we're about to be joined by one of the biggest names in the NFL from the mid from the from the mid two thousands. Uh, he was the two thousand five NFL Rookie of the Year. He was All Pro in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Led the league in sacks in two thousand six. He's a three time Pro Bowler. And if you know anything about me, you know that I love wrestling, and you know that I love the challenge. He's been involved with both of those things. Uh, and he's also now become one of the biggest promoters in combat sports uh, with lights out, extreme fighting, uh, really starting to gain a foothold here with people who enjoy the combat sports. But we are delighted to have him on tonight to talk about the Justin Fields situation. So please welcome to the show our guest, Sean Merriman, uh, my former colleague at the NFL Network as well. Sean, how you living? What's up, my man? How you doing? Oh God, man, NFL Network, man! I forgot about that. That's right. You man. forgot? How dare you? You forgot? I know, man. I like, know. I know. You're like, how do we know each other? Like, no, no, no. We used to go on. I think the last time that we were on the air together was back when we had the NFL AM show, and uh, I'm sure we were talking wrestling, and I'm sure we were getting into all that stuff. And I'm excited to talk about your fight that you're promoting here on February 16th in Long Beach, California. I'll, I want to ask you about that, but first. I want to start because I know that when you were promoting your previous fight, uh, you were talking with a lot of Chicago folks about Justin Fields and everything that's going on with that situation. And I really enjoy getting an outsider's perspective. Uh, the Bears fans were at each other's throats, so I think it's nice to get somebody else's view of this. And I want to make sure that I get this correct. But if I'm not mistaken, you said that the Bears should move on from Justin Fields. Can you kind of explain what you meant by that? Yeah, you know, that's what I said about that. Um, there's a lot of finger pointing going on right now in the organization. They've already fired fired some coaches. They're starting to yeah. shake things up a little bit. But there's been a lot of finger pointing pointed at Justin Fields. And, yeah. you know, he, he started off a little rough, you know, a little, you know, trying to figure things out, you know, got happy feet, making some really bad decisions. But we saw him get better over time. But this, the finger still pointed at him. Now, I know they brought in DJ Moore and they beefed, you know, they, they brought in some pieces, but I wasn't saying get rid of DJ, uh, uh, Justin Fields because of his performance. I was right. saying move on from him because if you think that that's not your guy, then let him go. Yeah. Right? I don't I don't think that someone in that position uh, have to walk into a locker room and, and, and the fan base and people are constantly screaming, "Hey, let's draft draft Caleb Williams. Let's go. Let's go move up and get 
So I'm like, hold on, he's not the problem. This this yeah. guy, it, there's much more problems in that organization than Justin Fields. So if you feel like he's a problem, then let him go. And so that was my whole thing about it. And and I, when I said, by the way, when I said let him go, he's going to go somewhere else and have success. I can yeah. guarantee you that he will. And and that is is a kind of how you kind of throw the, have a black eye in the fan base. Like, hey, you guys, you guys rushed him out. You, yeah. you didn't want him here. You you thought that someone else going to come in here and play much better than him. And look at this guy having much success somewhere else. So it wasn't saying to move on from Justin Fields because he's performing. But right. If you guys are questioning what he can do, then move on from him. No, I get exactly what you're saying. And I wanted to make sure that we uh, emphasize that point. Because a lot of the headlines that I saw, they're kind of striking, like, wait a minute. But I understand what you're saying uh, when you go in there and, and, and read or watch or listen or anything like that. You do believe that Justin Fields can be a great player in the NFL. And one of the things that, that strikes me, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on today, is that you sort of lived through a very similar situation. Yeah, you, Your first year in San Diego, Drew Brees was the starting quarterback. People don't, a lot of people, these, these kids today don't remember this. Drew Brees was the starting quarterback. Phillip Rivers was the backup. What was that situation like? Now I know that you're a rookie going into San Diego in 2005, but what was it like being in the middle of that thing with Drew Brees and Phillip Rivers? It, it was tough, man, because you knew how not only how great Drew Brees was on the field, but off of it. I'm talking about like the ultimate teammate, dude, just somebody you always wanted to be around. You believed in um, and someone just brought a lot to the team. But you already knew that next man was up. They already drafted Philip, And so I believe that if Drew didn't get hurt, they would have had a problem on yeah. their hands and trying to decide on which right route to go. And the fan base could have been very pissed off, right? Because Drew Lee's go and wins the Super Bowl somewhere else, right? They moved off of Philip. And the whole quote would be, Oh, you moved on from a Super Bowl quarterback, or or you, you know, or and you got Phillip there who didn't win the Super Bowl. And look now, like there's a yeah. there was a lot of turmoil, but it it, it kind of saved the charges in a way when Drew got hurt. And it was unfortunate because I was about 30 or 40 feet away when that happened. When I tell right. you that his shoulder dislocating sounded like a branch breaking. You can hear it that far. It was almost like, okay, well, we understand that we can move on from him because he's never going to be the same player. No one ever thought that Drew Brees would ever be the same player he was. Matter of fact, um, I used to see him throwing with Todd Durkin during the offseason, the, the, um, tra his trainer there in the offseason. Dude, I, I watched Drew Brees struggle to throw five yards Yeah, when he first started out. So no one uh, predicted Drew Brees getting back on top. So it worked out for the Chargers overall. Yeah, it's one of those things, too. The Dolphins were going to bring him in to be their quarterback with Nick Saban when he was there. And then Drew Brees didn't pass the physical. That's part of the reason why he ended up with New Orleans. So there's a lot of, you know, moving parts going on with that. I always, you know, because, you know, I see LaDainian Tomlinson somewhat regularly and he hates when I bring it up, but the Chargers were in a very interesting situation when they even drafted Phillip Rivers. So they could have drafted Larry Fitzgerald, who was available to them. They could have picked him first overall. And I talk about this with Ladanian, and I don't want to put words into Ladanian's mouth uh, because he's not here. But like I, he he gives me a look, and he he he's actually said like Adam, like don't bring this up anymore. Uh, stop talking about it. Do you see? Do you think though, with the Bears being in the position that they're at right now? Even though some things have been rocky with them, and it hasn't quite worked out, they fired Luke Getzey. Do you think that there's some merit to possibly like just drafting, just just going in and drafting Marvin Harrison with that first pick and going with it that way and committing to Justin Fields? I, I think that's the only thing to do, right? You you got DJ Moore on one side and you got Marvin Harrison Jr. on the other side. Who's going to stop that, right? Yeah. And you got so many weapons at that point, and they started to play better at other positions. They actually started to build a pretty damn good team. Yeah. The problem, the problem that I'm seeing now is that this build up with Justin Fields, right? Is you yeah. already pointing the finger at him. So the second that he doesn't start to play well, everybody's going to question whether they should have went out to Kayla Williams, whether yeah. they should have traded back and got a few more draft picks. So, I mean, that's the talk. And that's what happens when, you know, you get to the threshold of finger pointing that one person for so damn long is that they don't have any room for error anymore. And that is, and sometimes, man, it's, it's better for a player to have a fresh start somewhere else where you're walking in, you're the new guy in, in the locker room, people just seeing you for the first time, and now he's more polished. 
right? So you kind of shake hands, thank them for drafting, and, and go to a better situation. That that was my whole conversation about moving moving uh, moving on yeah. from Justin Fields. But man, if if Marvin Harrison is there and they don't draft him, I know the Bears has done some crazy crazy <laughs> things, some very True. some ridiculous things in the draft, and, and just the team are like letting Ro- Rokon Smith go and just letting Khalil Mack go after you know now he got seventeen sacks with the Chargers. They have done some things, but I think that that would take the cake if they don't draft Marvin Harrison and figure out a, a way to do something with Justin Fields. That would sting them for a very long time. Well, you're on a team. Now, obviously, you were talking about Drew Brees being injured and kind of gave the Chargers an out when they were able to let him go and everything. Is it a real thing? Could the could the Bears lose the locker room where if they traded Justin Fields, let's say they traded him to Atlanta, is there a real possibility that some player, as much as they love Caleb Williams, that some players are like, you know what, I don't, I don't like this. I, 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 I don't, I don't buy into this at all. Yeah. I mean, what can you do, right? Other than be disgruntled. And we, we know as players, we only got so much pull, so much power to a certain point, right? Like you can, you can be, uh, you can disgruntled, you can go in the media. And we've heard everybody say uh, that, like his own teammates, and how good Justin Fields is. I mean, several guys have come out and say, man, this dude is special. Yeah. So you, you let it be known, but what can you really do if you're in the contract? It's only but so much pull you have as a player. Um, but I, I really do feel that if you start making moves like that, guys, when it t- come to free agency, when it comes to, hey, man, should I re-sign with these guys? We just saw what they did with Justin Fields. Yeah. All, all those things come into play. So got t- players don't forget that. They, they don't forget that. They don't forget that when it's free agency time. They don't come. They don't forget that when it's contract negotiation time. Like if you do that to him, what about me? And yeah. so if they make that move. They, they're going to have some problems there. Yeah, because there's a lot of questions too. Because Jalen Johnson, his contract is up, and obviously he was been talking uh, on the radio recently about wanting to be the highest paid cornerback, and it kind of plays into it. And so I look at it too because. When Drew Brees leaves San Diego, you guys go 14 and two. Does that kind of help erase everything? Like there, I'm sure there were guys who were upset that Drew was let go and maybe they weren't sold on Phillip Rivers. But when you go 14 and two, you're like, yeah, I think we made the right decision. It, it was, it was a lot of that. It, it was a whole lot of that. And my, my in my personal preference, I'm, I'm going to say, I, I, I love both guys and I, yeah. Drew is one of the best, but from our team and, and the kind of, style that we played I and mean, we had a lot of back and f- a lot of crap talkers right we went we went back and forth with everybody and just the way we handled ourselves phil fit into that to <laughs> that like that circle more than drew did now after the 14 and 2 season now drew i mean then drew goes and win the super bowl yeah philip did not win the super bowl now the talk started to pick back up after we had you know like right around uh, oh Eight oh nine, I think they 2010. It was an AFC Championship again, or some, somewhere around there, yeah. right? Um, the talk picked back up because now Drew has a Super Bowl, or or, or was it eleven or twelve? Did they, did they want to? Yeah, Bowl I think it was 2011. You guys go yeah. to the, you go to the NFC Championship game in 2007, right? Uh, to go play the undefeated Patriots, yeah, yeah. And so the ch- the chatter picked back up after that, man, but. It's hard to say because, you know, you're really talking about two Hall of Famers. And I know that people are going to fight Phillip Rivers going to be in a Hall of Famer as much as they want to. Easy. And, I, and, I, and I'll and i give him this. If he doesn't go first ballot, okay. But to say that Phillip Rivers is not a Hall of Famer, you're crazy. So yeah. when you're talking about two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, how, how wrong can you really be? Yeah, it's true. And I, I don't want to bring up old stuff. Uh, I know exactly where I was when this happened, too. The, the divisional playoff game in 2006 against the Patriots. Um, I'm not going to, okay. I don't want to go into the details of that game. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm already, it's all, I don't, I don't even want to say the guys. I don't even want to say Marlon McCree's name or anything like that, <laughs> but very close. Here's my thing though. And this is, and this is where it pertains to the bears because this is where history could be very different. If you play host to the Indianapolis Colts in the 2006 AFC championship game, given the success that you guys had against the Colts, do you beat them by 30 or 40? Like, I don't think that that game is close if you're hosting the Colts in the AFC Championship game. Look, they, I mean, they had two great inside linebackers. Thomas Jones, I think, was a, was a running back at that time. We'd have beaten by 38. <laughs> and then it would, and then it would have been a Bears. Then it would have been a Bears versus Chargers Super Bowl, which is what I was hoping for as a Bears fan who had 
Chargers season tickets. Well, I had the mini plan. We used to go for four games a year, but it was always fun. Um, and one of the reasons, because of because of you, uh, such a fun team, like such a great team to think about. I really wish we would have played you guys in the Super Bowl. And I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road too much. But I, oh, that's the one where you're just like God. And I love Marty Schottenheimer. Uh, I was a huge fan of his, and so um, all that good stuff. That would have been fun. But we, but I can rest it now because I go around telling everybody. I'm like, because everybody talks about that. I'm like, you know, the Chargers would have beaten the, the goal, like destroyed them, like they always did in the playoffs. Uh, I do want to ask though, you were talking a little bit about Caleb Williams. Have you watched him play much? Cause like, I I've, I'm not a talent evaluator. I'll go in and I'll watch some more tape. Cause I don't, I don't really watch it during the season. What did you, have you got a sense of like how good Caleb Williams is? Cause it seems like every year there's always like, Hey, it's a generational talent, a quarterback. Is he the real deal? Well, I've been watching him since high school. He's from Washington, DC. Oh, that's so, right. I, He's what? Oh, do you, there you go. That's right. I've been, I've been watching him um, since he was a kid. And so the stuff that he's doing now, he's been doing for a long time. And how in the hell do we let him get out of? Yeah. America? What did you got? What happened? Oklahoma and USC. He kept getting I, farther away. I, I know. And, and so, you know, that was one of the ones they let slip out the cracks, but he's been doing this and he, he you know, I, I hate to throw that word like uh, generational talent around and it's, it's hard to, to keep that up because we don't know what guys real projections are. We're talking about projections. We saw guys, with generational college talent and not yeah. really transfer that into the NFL. But you have to see that his capabilities, his, on his, his capabilities are probably more suited for the NFL than it is in college football, because he's going to have better targets. He's going to have yeah. a better offensive line that that team was really, I mean, they, they, they wasn't that good as a no. team. USC was, they wasn't that good. And without him, they would have lost probably four or five more games. Truthfully. And I, I think that when you put a uh, a real team around him, an uh, offensive line, you give him a star wide receiver show and a tight end and a defense that can they can play worth a damn, he's going to be really, really good. And, and so we, we haven't seen anybody coming in. We're seeing Patrick Mahomes. We saw what he did at, uh, in, down in te- uh, Texas. Um, Texas Tech. Yeah, Texas Tech. We've seen it. But we ain't know Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes was Patrick Mahomes until he got to the NFL. We didn't know that he was – throwing sidearm passes and, and left. And, and he wasn't doing the things, everything he was doing in college. Caleb Williams is probably the most ready quarterback. And I, and I would say there's only NFL ready quarterback. There's only probably about four or five guys, I would say, in the last 10 years mm-hmm. that's come in and they're ready to go right now. And, you know, one of them is, is C.J. Stroud. I mean, we, we've seen him. And, I, and I'll take it back to Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck was probably one of the first ones we've seen in a while to come in, you're like, damn, this dude is ready for the NFL right now. He's already polished. So I think to Caleb Williams, you give him a, a nice staff of, of people around him, he's going to be ready to come out and, and do some damage right away. Yeah, I would agree with that too. And it reminds me of when Justin Herbert was coming out in the draft that he had struggled at Oregon against some of the big teams. You think about his game against Auburn and things like that. And people questioned him like, yeah, I don't know if it's going to he, – he struggles against the good teams. And then he comes out and he's immediately great. And I think Caleb Williams has that potential too. So I think the Bears are certainly in a position right now where either one of those guys can end up being great. And I think it's for the for the fans. I think we just need to chill out and let Ryan Poles do his thing. He's going to figure it out. And uh, I think it's a win win situation. And uh, we should enjoy that. So I do appreciate your insight and everything like that. And a unique perspective as somebody who kind of lived through that with Philip Rivers. Andrew Brees, but I want to talk to you about February 16th, Friday night, Lights Out Extreme Fighting will be hosting an event in Long Beach, California, Thunder Studios. Uh, The tickets are just 60 bucks and it's a very uh, intimate setting. Like if you're, if if anybody's ever a fan of like wrestling or some of these smaller shows, it's a great place uh, to see an event. Your promotion is really starting to grow. As a matter of fact, your, your event in January Grew its viewership by 90%. Uh, you had a main event fe- featuring two bantamweight women. How is this, how has this been going? Like, how did how did you get involved with this? And tell us a little bit more about the promotion. What it is this like a is this like a, a feeder to the UFC? What is what is the uh thought process behind this this whole promotion? Yeah, well, I've been around this um sport man for 17 years. I actually started training back in 2006 with Jay Glazer, Randy Gator, Tito Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, all these guys. 
Uh, I just started doing it to help my hands in football, be a better outside linebacker and pass rusher. And, and I just fell in love with the sport. So every offseason, I just did more and more. I got into grappling. I got into more of uh, sparring and everything else. I, hell, I still spar. But yeah. um, I think that more and more football players just transitioning out of what they do or even during the offseason should always pick up some form of combat sport. That's just me personally. We've seen what it did for Tua this this offseason and how he stayed healthy when he picked up jiu-jitsu. So – there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of information there that's, that's factual that it helps. Uh, so I launched Lights Out Extreme Fight, man. We're, we're on football TV, football sports. Did you just say we – our last couple of fights, two, two fights before this, we jumped 70% viewership. We had 90% viewership over this last fight. I think we cl- come close to that or more after this last fight. But this car is February 16th is our biggest one. This is our biggest car. We, we're, we're 25% sold out. Um, we, we hold up a crowd about 15 to 1700. Sometimes we, we get up to 2300 depending on the venue, but we love that man. We like the intimate, uh, intimate crowds. Um, and a lot of these guys get opportunity to go to UFC, and that's that's been the pretty, the pretty cool feeling that you know you bring guys to the rankings. You we show amateur fights, which no no one really does. We have four or five amateur fights on TV and seven or eight pro fights, so it's a big night. But this one, man, I, I do believe we got a couple people, a couple fighters on this card that got a real shot, man, of being superstars. And for us, it's about growing the next up and coming superstars. But at, you know, after this fight, man, we'll we'll have some big announcements, um, you know, streaming wise, and, and put ourselves in position to be streamed all over the world. I always, you know, obviously you're a big wrestling guy. I'm a big wrestling guy. Uh, we've always enjoyed that. I look at the growth of things like. You know, here locally in Southern California, like we have, you know, wrestling events going on at the Globe Theater. We saw where the Young Bucks and all those guys came up from and PWG and all these things. Do you kind of fancy yourself like that or do you really want to grow it bigger to where you would be a competitor against the UFC? Well, you know, for us, man, it's um, we, we never we're never looking to be in a competitor with the UFC. We, that's not, you know, why we got in this business. We love to. um to have the guys be a springboard to get there. What we will be able to do is we got some cool tech coming. I mean, tech gloves is can measure speed, power, punch, impact. Um, we, you know, we've become an incubator for this new AI. We're like fan engagement tech that we're going to be introducing this next fight, February 16th. We got a big announcement, a partnership come up, and we'll have data when guys get punched and hit to be pumping out on the screen so our broadcast can talk about it. So for us, man, it's about curating our own fans, our own crowd staying in our lane and just growing organically. We're not, you know, I think that there's some really good organizations out here. They are yeah. there's some really good organizations. And I think that sometimes they get blinded by trying to compete with each other. And if you grow your own talent, that's mm-hmm. what the, that's why the UFC is so big. It, it's not because everybody's thinking that they grew all of their talent, drew, uh, you know, grew them up and, yeah. and also branded them and, and um, promoted them, got behind them, and they turned into superstars. They, you know, the fans dictate how big you are. You don't, we can't come out and say, hey, we got a uh, certain such amount of members that we're the number three promotion organization in, in the country. Like we don't, we're not about that. We let those guys go ahead and do that. And we just want to keep doing what, what we're doing. Yeah. You know, it reminds me, you know, back when I was a younger man, I used to go down to the, at the time it was called the Galaxy Theater in Santa Ana, California. And there was a GWC wrestling and they used to have, and you'd go and see these shows, the guys who are going to potentially become superstars. And they used to have this guy called the prototype who was awesome. Like he just had the look and everything guy eventually becomes John Cena. So this is a cool thing. Like if you love combat sports and you love the UFC and you love MMA and all that stuff, I think that you need to check out this fight on February 16th. Again, if you're in the Southern California area, I would implore you to go. There's nothing like being at one of these fights in a small setting just to really be up close. This is the way you really want to see. You don't want to be in the big arenas. You want to be in these small, intimate settings. So February 16th, Lights Out Extreme Fighting. Sean, how can people find out more about this organization? They can go to lightsoutxf.com. Tickets are up and selling. Um, also, it's Lights Out XF on all the social medias. Um, at me, at Sean Merriman, I'm always posting you know different videos. My sign them up videos, I, I get a, a few out a week. Um, and, and so this this has been fun, man. And we we're making. I mean, this this growth has been phenomenal. It's never happened in the sport. I think a little bit too, obviously, because I come from the NFL, which is obviously the biggest platform we have here in the yeah. country. And <laughs> getting a chance to bring some new eyeballs to the sport, it, it's been really cool, man. But we we are growing at a rate that um, 
Sometimes I look at it like, oh, damn, it's kind of scary, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we're, we're a month out from the fight, and we're 25 or 30% sold out uh, of the venue. And that that shows me that the fans are liking what we're doing. They, they appreciate the production quality and the fighters. This fight, man, I, I, you know, I don't, I've never said this about any one of our fights before. This particular fight, um, and the reason why I sold out, because we got the most badass fighters in Southern California that's coming up, which the reason why I sold out halfway like it is um you you want to catch this one and, and go to get your tickets at lights out all right well thank you so much first of all i gotta say you know i've, I've loved you ever since you came out and were drafted by the chargers i uh, loved watching you play football it was great being a colleague with you and i'm really proud of what you've done after your playing days of over because i know this was in a passion of yours for quite some time so i i love seeing you actually your lights out t-shirt that you gave me years ago is still one of my favorite t-shirts to wear it is the most comfortable t-shirt that i've ever owned but uh, i appreciate you uh thanks for coming on i hope we can connect again some other time in the near future uh but it was great catching up with you and uh that's all i got you got it brother thanks for having me all right. Thanks so much. There he goes. The great Sean Merriman. It was awesome to have him on a uh, wonderful person. I remember too, he was on NFL AM shortly when he had the little thing with CM Punk. And it was funny because if you ever watch the challenge, him and CM Punk actually went uh, face to face and kind of like squashed the little thing that was good. It was amazing. So uh, great to see Sean going out there and doing some uh, great things in the world of extreme combat sports but speaking of other sports what about the nfl what about's going on with the playoffs well here to talk about it uh from foxsports.com as she always does it's carmen vitale and she's here she's warm she's ready to go <laughs> you know uh, i don't think uh tampa bay needs to fight the weather uh they're gonna play indoors so how are listen you? Uh, how are you I'm good. I'm better than that reporter, I am sure, unfortunately. Uh, it speaks to, though, an issue, a larger issue in the journalistic community yes. of the fact that the news reporters that aren't usually on this beat uh, yep. are usually called in to come into these press conferences when teams go to the postseason, all that kind of stuff, because a lot of these news departments have gotten rid of their sports department. And that's... Yes kind of what happens uh you get some of these people that aren't as experienced or haven't been following the team as closely uh yeah so i always i always hated that when the register would send me out someplace uh to go cover like in, in a smaller level like we had a guy at the orange county register he still works there dan albano and he covered all the aqua sports so mm. i remember every once in a while i was i think i was the only one that he trusted outside of the Steve Fryers and stuff He's like, Hey, can you go cover this event? And like one time I totally whiffed on something and like, where you just don't know. You're like, Oh, was I supposed to add? Like, I don't know. You don't let me cover your sport. Like, I don't like there was some, some woman wasn't performing or wasn't playing. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't know. Like, I'm sorry. Like you could have briefed me uh, ahead of time and you try to understand it. And so I felt I was with her. Like, I'm like, I've been there. Like I've been yeah. asked to do things that are not in my wheelhouse and I've looked the fool and then everybody goes out there. Peter Schrager actually brought that up too. Like, listen, like, yeah. like you said, like it's very difficult um, with everybody cutting back. So uh, she's not yeah. trying to be obtuse. It just, it is what it is, but listen, how, how are you living? Are, are you excited for the <laughs> NFC at the NFC central? You might, you're not old enough to remember this, Carmen. I, what are you talking about? The, the, the Buccaneers, like, the Buccaneers used to be in the center. <laughs> Three of our teams. Yeah, they were, what, until 2002. I was 13 in 2002. I remember all of this. All right, just listen. You're you're a young lady. I don't want to, I don't want to age you or anything like that, that. I'm not that young anymore, Adam. <laughs> I just had my 35th birthday, so I'm not that young. <laughs> we missed your birthday? What the heck? I, I it was, it was. I was broadcasting with you guys on my birthday. Stop it. How do we not? Sammy. I, don't, I blame me. I, 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 I blame. Sammy. I don't, I, I don't, I don't make a big deal out of my birthday because it's January 3rd and everybody is so oh partied out from everything like That's Christmas, New Year's, everybody's dry, like doing dry January. So they're sober. They're oh broke God, because of the holidays. Yeah. Nobody ever wanted to do anything on my birthday growing up. So uh, I just, no, I never, I just didn't, I don't really celebrate my birthday like that. So it was fine. And it was nice to have business as usual. I had, we went to a nice dinner, went for a nice walk. Uh, it was great. So, yeah. All right. I, my mom's birthday was December, was in December after Christmas. 
And I'm like, that yeah. was the worst. She like, gets that, it. The same thing. Uh, so you understand. Well, happy belated birthday. Sorry yes. that we didn't have a cake for you or anything like that. But uh, you're you're enjoying some good football uh, coming up. Before we get into the bear stuff and the with the stuff of the offensive coordinators, what do you think? Like I. I picked the 49ers to win this week because this is what I do. I I was sincere last week. I really did believe that the Packers, it was not, I was not trying to jinx anybody. I didn't know until after the fact that I was the lone wolf. I was actually shocked that I was the only one picking the Packers to beat the Dallas Cowboys, given their history. I think the Packers have a real shot against the 49ers and it really concerns me. Yeah. I think so too. I mean, San Francisco's defense, if you could call it a weakness, uh, hasn't been super stout against the run yeah. and Aaron Jones is coming on. I mean, obviously he always does good things about the Dallas Cowboys. I looked up his splits ahead of the game on Sunday and I mean, he hasn't had anything but a hundred yard games against the Dallas Cowboys, multiple touchdown games. He had four touchdowns, uh, at, in one game in 2019 and then followed up yesterday with, or yesterday, Sunday. I don't know what day okay. it is. Whatever. Um, he followed it up Sunday with three touchdowns. It's it's it, it it matches up. The Packers match up pretty well with the 49ers. Uh, that being said, though, the 49ers are on two weeks of rest at this point. The Packers are on a short week after playing their defense played 95 snaps <laughs> on Sunday in Dallas. And if there is anything I'm concerned about with the Packers right now, it has been that defense. So that's not the best start in the world, but there's going to be a whole lot of adrenaline going. And also these guys are all young, so they can handle it. Right? Yeah, they should be able to handle it. They're fine. <laughs> they really, they started getting it going uh, against the Chicago bears. I thought they played a very, very good defensive game. And then you played 95 set 95 snaps, but it's against the Cowboys. So it doesn't really count. Actually, Dak Prescott threw for 400 yards. I know it's a blowout and these yeah. things are different. I kind of, I know that things are not like, you can't make these kind of um, comparisons or anything like that. So I, I, I know it and people were roasting me, but I'm like, at the same time, I'm like, as great as the Packers were playing, I'm like, the Bears defense did do a nice job against them the previous week without Jalen Johnson holding them to 17 points. Obviously the Bears weren't turning the ball over. They were running more effectively to hold on to the ball longer. But I mean, like the Bears should be like, hey, at least we didn't look like Dallas. I mean, I think a lot of teams are hanging their hat on the fact that at least they didn't look like Dallas. Uh, it's it, it's one of those things where I you can only game plan for so many people, though, and that's what's been so impressive about this Packers offense is there have been guys that continue to step up in the face of injury, and you just don't know which of these young players is going to pop off because they all have the capability to do so. I was looking back at a bunch of these games, and I mean, you saw Romeo Dobbs against the Bears – uh, or against the Cowboys, I'm sorry, against the Cowboys, just completely gash their defense and find yeah. these soft spots in the zone and was just had no no one around him. Luke Musgrave finally got <laughs> into the end zone on that tight end leak play that he, he they ran week one against the Chicago Bears where Luke caught the ball but stumbled. This time yeah. Luke stayed on his feet and was clear into the end zone. There wasn't a guy within 16 yards of him when he caught that ball. But then you had, you know, against the Bears, there there were there was this other guys that went off. I was it Jaden Reed that that game. I think Jaden had Reed over 100 okay, yards. Yeah. Um yeah, and then like the the game before that, you had Tucker Craft who had a, like multiple catches, I think got up to 60 or 70 yards, but then also had a touchdown. It's just you never know with this Green Bay Packers offense who is going to go off, and that makes them so dangerous, and it makes them hard to defend for anybody because you just don't necessarily have all of the guys on the field. You only have 11 guys on the field, so you don't yeah. know who to key in on. And when Aaron Jones is there, you know, people are talking about the right. Green Bay Packers, like, oh, they had this rough stretch in the middle of the field, uh, the middle of the season. You're like, yeah, Aaron Jones wasn't there. Like, Aaron Jones is Aaron like Jones one is of out. the more – he's an underrated player. Uh, I hate to give him that credit, yeah. but as a fantasy dork, and sorry, I don't mean to be looking at my phone. I forgot. Sammy was like, retweet this already, Rank. And so um, somebody was, wait, oh my gosh. By the way, the uh, the NFL people got my prediction wrong. I did not pick the Ravens. No, wait. Wait, is that me? I did take the Ravens. Oh, nope, I didn't take the Ravens. So if you see my thing out there, about me taking the Ravens, I actually took the Texans. Don't believe everything. Um, they They screwed me this week. It's okay. I'll take it either way. Um, cause I'm going to go on Instagram and say, I'm taking the Texans. Then it'll be one of those things. Uh, what about the lions right. though? 
I was worried about the Lions. You know, they had such an emotional win. Like, finally, they beat Matthew Stafford. They get over the hump. There's a lot of celebrating. When I saw the locker ce- locker room celebration, and I was listening to Jared Goff, Jared Goff of all people, I'm like, damn. I go, this team, I don't know. Like, this seems not, this does not seem like a team like, hey, look at what we did. I think Jared Goff had the right tone. I think I'm in on the Lions. I think I'm good. What? How do you feel? I mean, Tampa Bay has obviously, uh, I mean, they played very well last week against the Eagles, but they had struggled going into the playoffs. Uh, they scored nine points against Carolina. So I was kind of kind of concerned about them, but obviously they go off against the Eagles. I think the Lions kind of handle this Buccaneers team. Oh my gosh, I know it's your Buccaneers too. I'm sorry. I don't want to put you it's on the okay. spot. But I think it's I think okay. the Lions, I think the Lions are pretty and I, and I think they got the right mindset. They do. And honestly, I saw that with the Packers too. What really struck me about the Packers, because I was in Dallas for the game, I, they, I was right there as they were coming off the field into the tunnel. I stood right there. I got a bunch of video. And honestly, I didn't post most, most, most of it. Wow, I can't talk today. I didn't post most of it because the guys weren't doing anything crazy. I mean, Aaron Jones yelled a little bit. Jordan Love was, you know, smiling. And that was the same with the Lions because this is business as usual. This is unfinished business for all of them. These guys have an incredible belief in themselves. That's something I've talked about with the Lions all season long, which is what's made them such a joy to cover is they have this incredible singular belief in themselves that insulates them from any of the outside noise and it keeps them focused. And that is a testament to Dan Campbell. That's a testament to Brad Holmes. That's a testament to the coaching staff, ownership group, everything, ownership family, I should say. Um, I, I really think that the lions aren't going to be spooked or distracted by the emotion of what they were able to accomplish this last week. They get home field advantage and they are going to have all the emotion they need to like kind of channel from that crowd. Um, I really wish I was in Detroit. I mean, I was in Dallas and that was a really cool experience. Don't get me wrong, but I really wish I had been in Detroit. I'm going to be in Detroit this week. So I'm really going to need Lions fans. I'm really going to need Ford Field to match whatever energy you had last week because I want to see it too. (laughs) No, I do. And I, I, I'm thinking back to the uh, 91 NFC divisional round game. I don't know if they played a wild card game uh, that season, but Mm-hmm. Thinking about the how hyped that team was. And they must not have played because this is back in the old days. They might not have played that game. But yeah, that game against the Cowboys, I think they were ready to go. I feel if they were playing the Packers this week, it would be off the charts. But if they can do that, there's a potential. You know, they play host to the Packers in the NFC Championship game. And it would be wouldn't that be wild? That would be. I, I can't, can't. I can't get over the fact that I have two teams from my division that are in and your and your and the Bucks. Who you, and then I've got, and then I've got my bucks, and I do get, I, I get to see those guys this weekend. I'm so excited. I haven't seen them in over a year. Um, so, well, no, that's not true. I, I saw them at combine last year, but no, still, I so. haven't seen them. I haven't, you know, been around the team in about in over a year. So I'm so excited. But I can't uh, really see those guys. But I can't really enjoy football until the Packers are gone. Like that's we need that. <laughs> Uh, we need the Packers to go ahead and get eliminated. So then everything is just house money. Cause even at Detroit, I, I wouldn't care. Detroit could go to the Super Bowl. They could do whatever. Doesn't matter to me. We just need the Packers eliminated. Then you can kind of breathe easy. It's kind of like when the Dodgers get eliminated from the playoffs, you're like, okay, now I can, uh, now I can enjoy this. Uh, the Celtics getting eliminated. Like, okay, now this feels good. Uh, the Pistons. That was the one thing too, is I haven't been able, we haven't been able to enjoy the Pistons being like, Oh, and I think the Pistons finally won. I'm like they lost 26 games. See, I, I get Detroit up. has Detroit has been in a bad way for a long time. Yeah. With, its, with all of its sports teams. I mean, when was the last time the Tigers were consistently good too? Like, yeah, it's just not. Were they in the World not, Series like 2011? I think it was. Yeah, Something, it's long time it's ago. It's been at least Cardinals. a decade. Yeah, it's been a it's been a minute for them. Uh, but let's talk now about the Chicago and for everybody who's like, what about the. Stop. Do you want to go through the Justin Fields debates again? Like they, we've covered all the ground that you can cover with Justin Fields. And it was great to have Sean Merriman uh, to come in here and give some perspective on that. I do want to know about the offensive coordinator position. Have you heard anything? I know that when Greg Roman was brought in, is that a thing of like, I don't know. There's something about interviewing Greg Roman that just feels like a Ryan Poles smoke screen. Like, oh, well, if Roman's going to be the coach, then that means Justin Fields is because it wouldn't make sense to have him if Caleb. I think he's, I think he's tweaking us. I think that's, I think that's almost like Ryan Poles doing his due diligence, but also trolling us. 
I mean, I think to me that tells me that this decision really isn't made yet. And that Ryan Pohl said that he was going to be presenting each scenario at quarterback to all of these offensive coordinator candidates. And I don't necessarily hate that as far as a strategy in, in hiring your offensive coordinator. I mean, the Buccaneers last year were interviewing offensive coordinator candidates before they knew if Tom Brady was officially retired yet. Yeah. So like this happens. And if you, if you are placing an emphasis on a guy that can come in and tailor his system to his players, then yeah, I mean, this makes sense to go about it this way. And, but it also makes me think that maybe this decision really isn't made with Justin Fields um, or it is a matter of doing your due due diligence. I do um, know that the bears had interest in bringing Greg Roman in mid season this year, but it just didn't happen for whatever reason. I think Greg Roman is one of those guys. He has enough experience. He has a track record where he's not going to come in unless he has the title, which makes sense. But I think, you know, he's shown the ability to mold a system to a guy which has is usually a running quarterback, yeah. places a large emphasis on the run. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, though, either in a league that's cyclical. And I think that we're kind of due and we're seeing how important run games are coming around to be because defenses aren't really built to defend them anymore. But then you also see these other candidates that the Bears have interviewed, and it really ranges the gamut between guys that have been a part of the Shanahan McVay tree or guys that do have play calling experience. I mean, a guy like Shane Waldron, who has play calling experience and is only really available because Pete Carroll up and retired. I mean, yeah. that seems like a really good idea to go in and get a guy like that who is responsible for Geno Smith's resurgence and clearly has demonstrated an ability to evolve his systems with his personnel uh i think that's the number the driving force behind all of this and they're going about it in a good way um so far from what i've seen but uh, this this decision is they need to make a decision soon because they're not the only team that needs an offensive coordinator yeah i was wondering is there a timeline to this i mean what are you hearing i've talked again talking to some other people it feels like the bears are going to make a decision pretty quickly and they're going to try to move on and then get into the quarterback evaluation process. Yeah. If they want experience, you're going to have to move quickly. Yeah. If the decision is to go with maybe, maybe more of an up and comer, take a chance on a guy that hasn't called plays, um, which I don't know if that's the right thing to do. After don't do that just, again. No, no, no. I mean, it, it can work out. Obviously it worked out with Bobby yeah. Slowick in, in Houston. It can absolutely work out, but it has to be the right guy. Um, if that's the route you're going to go, then I guess you have a little bit more time and, and, and you can kind of weed through some of more, some more candidates. But if you want experience, if you want a guy that's called plays before, if you want a guy that can really tailor a system to the personnel that you are going to have, no matter what that looks like, you got, you got to move quickly. You just do. So, so Shane Waldron called plays this last season. Has it been for two years or has it just been for the last season? <sighs> Because when Canales to... was there, he sure. was the quarterbacks coach. He did not call. Because I don't think he called plays. Yeah, that's what I. Because I was. Because uh, yeah. I think they were talking about that on the broadcast that like this was Canales's first season calling plays. Yeah, uh, when Tampa took a t like Tampa took a chance on him absolutely. because he did he had not called plays before, and that was what's really impressive is that Todd Bowles basically staked his job on Dave Canales, who and yeah. he didn't have a prior relationship with Dave Canales either, which I found really interesting too. Canales just blew him away that much in the interview and with how smart he is and how good of a teacher he is. But the Bucks absolutely took a chance. And that's another, you know, that's another uh, result or another example rather of that working out for, a, for a team where you, you, you get a guy that is an up and comer and didn't call plays, but you have to look at the guys that were under him, even as a quarterbacks coach. So you looked at Dave Canales, you saw what he helped do with Geno Smith um, and his track record with developing quarterbacks. And I think the same goes for Bobby Slowick, what he was able to do with, with just a rotating cast of quarterbacks and keep that team, not only afloat, but in elite offense uh, in, in uh, San Francisco, those are the type of guys that you can take a chance on, or you can afford to take a chance on. I think that was the big thing with Luke Getze was you were taking a chance on a guy that had never called plays, but that had also had a quarterback who didn't need a lot of coaching in Aaron Rodgers, And that's, I think where you kind of not messed up necessarily, but I guess messed up. <laughs> no, a little bit because 
Well, that's one of the things with Bobby Slowick is that he was on the same staff as D'Amico Ryan's. So they had a relationship. They knew each other. They knew what was going on. So I feel like they've probably had talked before and they had like some sort of understanding and they, you know, they were again from the same coaching staff. So I think that means a lot as opposed to like, I mean, it's not like Eberflus brought in a guy from the Colts. It's not like he brought in Shane Steichen or somebody like that, or, you know, like just somebody who is in his, you know, who was there with him. So he would know, like, oh, I know this guy. I've seen him at work every day for the past four years. Uh, although Ryan's hadn't been there that long in San Francisco, but still uh, long right. enough. So I, I feel like there is something to be said about that. But for me, once we started interviewing Shane Waldron, I was like, okay, we're done. Let's let, let's wrap this up. Let's give it a go. I Although I have heard uh, one of the guys who is being interviewed and who will be in, if he hasn't been interviewed yet, he's expected to be interviewed was actually one of the names that I was hearing during the regular season of like, Oh, like he wasn't expected. He was going to be, he was going to need to switch teams. Uh, His head coach was going to be fired. So I kind of had a sense that some other guy will be in there in the mix. And I, it's a popular name and people know who it is. I can't say, uh, cause if you do, then you'll be able to source who I'm talking about. But, um, but I really like Shane Waldron. I think, I think what they've done in Seattle, what they did in Seattle uh, gives me a lot of hope for whichever quarterback it's going to be, whether it's Justin Fields or Caleb Williams and uh, going about it that way. But Sammy does say that we have some questions here. So if we do have an opportunity to take a few of these, uh, Melbourne Bartholomew, uh, question for Carmi, doesn't three first round rookies save you money like a rookie quarterback contract? And especially if you can guarantee a rookie wide receiver like Neighbors, or Marvin Harrison Jr., who are who are forty million wide receivers, yeah, forty million dollar wide receivers on rookie contracts. Again, we've talked about the economics of this and like a quarterback on a rookie contract, but you know, you have your right tackle on a rookie contract for a long time. You could conceivably have three players on rookie contracts from this draft class in the first round. Doesn't that help save some money as well? It does, but I'm going to push back a little bit on this $40 million wide receiver number. There's no the receivers that make $40 million a year. Tyreek Hill is the highest paid, and he's $30 million. Okay. So uh, there's – and even with letting them play out a rookie contract, I still don't think wide receiver contracts are going to be at $40 million in four to five years. Uh, that would be insane. And maybe it will. I don't know. I don't, you know, inflation's inflation's a, a you-know-what. Yeah. But the, the most expensive position is quarterback. Uh, and also if you do take rookies and there's no guarantee that you get three first round picks, by the way, because it depends on who you trade down with. If you only trade down a couple of spots, you're not getting three first round picks out of this. Um, I, I I don't know what the price is necessarily again, but you're also then taking a chance on three other players versus just one. And that's, that's the risk factor in all of this is yeah. Would it save some money that way for a while? It would. That's absolutely true. But then you're, you're counting on all three of those guys in your example, or all however many of those guys to hit and to be the guy that you need him to be right away. And yeah. there are positions that take a little bit longer to develop. And I don't know that you, you're not going to get those savings without taking a bigger risk because you're taking a bigger risk on multiple players than if you were to just take a quarterback have the savings that way and you're only taking a risk with one player granted it's the most important player i get that but uh there are those are the economics to that and i think that's probably in response to some stuff i said this week and last week right uh, or maybe this week because i don't i didn't think i said it on your podcast last week um we've 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 mentioned this point before like you're you're still saving money and i think I think ultimately you just got to figure out who's, who's the quarterback that you want. Like that's, yeah. that's probably the biggest thing. And could you see a situation? Cause last year, and it obviously worked out for them. They, in addition to getting CJ Stroud, who gets all the headlines and everybody's talking about him, the Texans were very aggressive in moving move back, back up, up to the, to the number yeah. three spot to get uh, Will Anderson from the, uh, from yeah. the university of Georgia. Could the Bears do that? Now, obviously, if the Bears take Caleb Williams, then maybe, you know, the commanders are like, well, it doesn't matter now uh, which quarterback because we can move down. That if you could get the, the commanders to jump from two to nine or drop from two to nine, 
that maybe the Bears go after both of those guys and do just something completely crazy? Would it would it make sense the Bears to be similar to what the Texans did this year and be like, you know what, we're doing everything. We're we're not we're not the future is now and we're making a run for it right now. I mean, I think that that's entirely a possibility, actually, and it's not something I, I had really considered before. But um, just off the top of my head, this was I've talked a lot about how this is probably a three year rebuild, right? Yeah. You don't have a lot more holes to fill on this roster. You really don't. And because of all that talent that you have, because a lot of it is young. I mean, the Bears are in the top five for the youngest teams in the league right now. Uh, I think you absolutely could finagle something like that and maybe sacrifice some draft capital this year to move back up and get a guy that is more of a sure thing, maybe less of a risk than you would get at number nine, depending on who that is. If that's if like in this scenario that you just said, the Bears could conceivably get Caleb Williams and Marvin Harris. Yeah, never, yeah. like I mean, legitimately. So you yeah. get you get the best of both worlds in being able to reset the quarterback clock while also bringing in a guy that is a big-bodied receiver that is different than DJ Moore and gives you some flexibility in that wide receiver room and really set up a young quarterback for success. So that's, I mean, again, you have there's there, there's so many things that had to go right for Houston to be able to pull that off. Right. And a lot of it is some of it is out of the was out of Houston's control and would be out of the Bears control as far as the desire to move into that spot and take the number nine pick off their hands and all that good stuff. And depending on what the package would be. But I mean, that's not out of the realm of possibility, as we saw with Houston last year. So that that would be very interesting. And considering if you're going to make the move to go to Caleb Williams, at some point, that means Justin Fields would be dealt, which means you would have extra draft capital to start throwing around to, to entice teams to move down because we don't know what the commanders feel. They might feel like it's either Caleb Williams or we could actually just drop on down and get not JJ McCarthy, but you know, somebody like who's not Drake may or what, whatever it is, there's, there's a legitimate possibility. And if you're the bears knowing that you're going to get some sort of pushback, for getting rid of Justin Fields, who is very popular with the fans and very popular in the locker room. That if you're like, well, we got, if you pull a full, full on Kevin Costner from draft day, you're like, yeah, but we got Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr. I think people will be like, okay, that's pretty good. We'll, we'll figure this out. I'll root for Justin and Pitt in Washington or wherever it is or Pittsburgh or whatever. Uh, we'll figure it out. Uh, we would move forward. So many different things. And I'm glad that you also mentioned that the Bears are one of the younger teams in the NFL because we hear a lot of that. We heard a lot of that over the weekend. You know, they were talking about the Packers, rightfully so. Very young team. A lot of young. And the Lions, uh, too. The Lions are the fifth the Lions. team in the league, which is and, wild. And that's the thing. It's like, at the same time, when everybody's saying, like, hey, like, people are like, hey, this division's not getting easier. I'm like, these are the Bears. Like, we're actually, we're building, too. Like, we conceivably had a 90% chance of sweeping the Lions this season. We were at least competitive with the Packers in that week 18 contest. We weren't blown out like the Cowboys. We held that team to 17 points without Jalen Johnson on the field. It looks like Jalen Johnson's going to come back. Is he going to be happy about his contract? Maybe not because it feels like there's some work to be done. But both sides have Yesterday's said like, price is not today's price for Jalen Johnson after making second team all pro. I can tell you that. And it's fair, you know, and it's, and it's completely real. That's, that's fine. You know what? Like I'm totally down with it. And I think that, you know, Ryan Poles said like, we anticipate him being back in Chicago. And if it's a tag deal that would eventually, we got to work on some things. He's likely going to be back in Chicago. And again, he's turning 25 in April. So again, a very young team as well, who is getting better. So we can say the division's getting better. We're also getting better. So we can, we can take that uh, as well. Um, hold on. Sammy's sending me notes and I can't read because I don't have glasses, but at any event, do we have a question? Well, he said, well, no, he said Mike McCarthy is not getting fired per Adam Schefter. Oh, is that what he said? God bless Jerry Jones. Keep up. Like what? That's fine. Like I thought, I thought that. Ooh, does this mean Bill Belichick is going to Atlanta? Could you imagine? Could you imagine him in Atlanta? And he loves Justin Fields. Uh, to put the further uh, conspiracy theorists out there, he loves he loved Justin Fields. I remember that Monday night game uh, where they went out there and Justin kind of had his breakout game. Bill Belichick was raving about him. And so who knows? Josh McDaniels coming down there probably as well. And oh, bring in Patricia. Just get the whole band back together. But it's it's an interesting thing because I thought for sure that 
when Jimmy Johnson was finally put into the ring of honor and Jerry Jones oh, yeah. had some moments of reflection, a lot of like, cowboy fans, <laughs> you know, they're like, Hey, you know what? Like maybe we shouldn't have, we shouldn't have fired him. Like I know Barry Switzer won a title, but probably shouldn't have done that. And that maybe Jerry was like, maybe I'll give up a little bit of control to somebody who can come in here and write the ship and get us to the Super Bowl. Now, apparently that's not going to be the case. Although with Adam Schefter, he's shamed people into not retiring. So maybe <laughs> he's shaming Jerry Jones shaming. into not retaining into firing Mike, Mike McCarthy. McCarthy. I guess a, well, it's a I, I know a lot of Cowboys fans thought the Jimmy Johnson curse was lifted because they finally put Jimmy Johnson in the ring of honor. And this was yeah. perhaps the biggest collapse <laughs> that the Cowboys have seen pretty much ever. Uh, it was Jerry Jones. I was, the, I was in his scrum right after the game. And he even said, he's like, this is the most hurtful, surprising thing that I've been through. And like, since I've been in this sport and I was just like, really? uh, all right. So that Jimmy Johnson juju didn't really work for the Cowboys. Did it did not help at all. I still would say for them that the 94 NFC championship game was worse because they had the potential. I don't think this Cowboys team was going to the Super Bowl. They did. They just weren't. That 94 team still had pretty much everybody except for Ken Norton Jr. who had gone over to San Francisco. And you just saw, like, Jerry Jones had once said, like, 500 coaches could coach this team and win a Super Bowl. I'm like, well, you hired 501. Uh, but apparently not because Barry Switzer did eventually win it in 1995 uh, because of the Packers. Um, yeah, it's wild. That, okay, God bless Jerry Jones. So, listen, you think it's bad of us? Keeping Matt Eberflus, that's way worse. That is way worse. And uh, so, listen, at least we're not the Cowboys. And we held the Packers to 17. It's just stupid. We'll put up a banner, apparently. Uh, is there another question, though, Sam? I know. this. I don't want to be talking about, like, moral victories, but at some point, uh, here I Okay, here, so here is a question. This is from John Perry. If the tape of both Fields and Williams looks so familiar to each other, why would you move on from fields? I think it goes back to what Carmen's been saying since about week eight or even sooner, or even, you know, like the quarterback, like there is a science to team building and resetting your quarterback clock, because it feels like every time you talk to a fan, they're like, let's keep Justin Fields. But Carmen, you know, this as well as anybody, when you talk to people who have either currently make decisions in the NFL or have made decisions in the NFL, they're all like almost to a person are all on board with moving on and getting mm -hmm. Caleb Williams. Yeah. I mean, this, my opinion has been informed by other people. It's not just my opinion. It's me talking to people all around the league that do make these decisions for a living. Uh, and not to say that every single one of them is right all the time, but they are very consistent in their belief. And everyone I've talked to that says reset the quarterback clock and th that that question is a testament to exactly why. Do you really think that Caleb Williams isn't going to be at least as good as Justin Fields? Because yeah. if you think he's going to be at least as good as Justin Fields, now you can save yourself some money. And this brings up another point that I've talked about this week, which is not something I've heard a lot of people talk about, which is the financial component of it. In the sense that the Bears as an organization, the McCaskies as an ownership family, are about to embark on a stadium build, which is going to require them to put up a lot of capital. And this all, I'm saying this is a factor in the decision. I'm not saying this is the end all be all, but you have to consider the fact that, okay, if you keep Justin Fields, that means you're conceivably two years away from having to put up a 40 to $50 million quarterback contract for this guy yeah. yearly. And in order to not have that all 50 million of that for arguments purposes, hit the cap, you have to front a lot of that money in the form of a bonus or in ways that bring that cap hit down. That requires ownership to be liquid. Also, you had, I think it went into why they kept Matt Eberflus, who was clear, who clearly had another year on his contract. You can't afford to pay a coach and a coaching staff, by the way. It's not just Matt Eberflus. A lot yeah. of times these coaches have, the assistant coaches have two-year contracts or multiple-year contracts. You can't, you can't pay these guys to go away when you're staring down a multi-billion dollar stadium build. And I get that the Bears are worth billions and I get that the McCaskies are rich, but they are also, their livelihood depends on this team. And I think you see that with ownership across the league. Owners that whose livelihoods depend on the team that they own 
you see a reluctance to spend money versus owners that make their money elsewhere and treat their teams like a glorified, very expensive hobby. Like a fantasy uh, football that's just, team. Right. That's, that's just, that's kind of the thing across the board where you see, and we haven't seen the McCaskies historically want to spend money either. Yeah. So I think that this absolutely factors into his decision on whether you keep a quarterback that you could potentially owe $50 million to a year for an extended period of time in a couple of years on top of why you kept the coach who, again, I think independently of that warranted another year, because if you sold a three-year rebuild, he deserves the opportunity to see it through, especially when they were on track anyway. But you have to take these things into consideration. I've seen how the sausage is made. I've worked as a part of the organ as an organization. I've worked very closely with some with front offices and I've seen these things up close. This stuff absolutely matters. Uh, whether it should or not, that's not for me to say, but I'm here to tell you it does. Yeah. And I, I truly believe too, because one of the conversations I've been having on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it, people say, well, here we go again, we're rinse repeating with, and I've said this a lot too, is I don't, I, I would have rather have reset everybody. If you're going yeah. with Caleb Williams, reset with everybody. But at the same time, I started thinking about this. I'm like, what if Matt Eberflus is actually an okay coach? Like, what if he doesn't get fired this right. year? Then it doesn't right. matter. It doesn't matter. And if your offensive coordinator is now jived with the quarterback, it's probably better. I'm not giving up on Justin Fields. I love Justin Fields. I want him to be the quarterback of the Bears. But I also understand that there's merit to the other side of the fence. And I think that we're – and this is – I think I'm starting to see more of this too is like people being like, we're in a win-win situation. So let's just let Ryan Poles deal with this. We're fans. We don't have that. We don't listen. I know that we're all sophisticated because we play Madden and we have the, it, we have the, we have the ability to watch the all 22s. There are people who are, who are much better at this than we are. Let's let them figure it out. Right. And outside of the chase Claypool thing, I think Matt, uh, Ryan Poles has done a great job. So uh, I'm down with it. Yeah, but same. But in any event, so I want you to go out and enjoy Detroit, which is actually a cool city. Uh, it'll be, it'll be a little bit. It cold. really is. I love it Detroit. Really I love Ford Field. Uh, I've been there for some big games this season, and yeah. but I haven't seen this playoff atmosphere. The video that I saw of Eminem literally leading on the jumbotron the entire crowd in rapping "Lose Yourself." Yeah. And then Chad Smith being the halftime performance, like just yeah. going off on the drums. I'm like, oh my God, I need to see. This. Yeah. It's <laughs> amazing. I'm see it. Yeah. Detroit, I'm it's, see it. it's, I'm it's the, it's the weird thing about the NFC North because Minneapolis, St. Paul, amazing Detroit. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Chicago, obviously one of the top cities in the world. And then green Bay just sucks. Just a terrible place. Just a it's dumb a cool stadium. You have, not, to, you have to give it that. Fine. You have it's to a, give it that. It's first a really of all, cool stadium. It reminds me one time like this. I I don't know if it was this year or last year, but Mooch came up to me. He's like, hey, he's like, you ever been to Green Bay? And I'm like, nope. He's like, you got to go. And I'm like, I really don't. No, I, I don't. don't, Mooch. I got, I, if I never set foot in that state, like people are asking me, like, are you going to the draft? And I'm like, no. If I'm going to go. If I'm going to go to the draft, I'll just go to Chicago and hang out and have a good time as opposed to being at a day's in, in uh, Wisconsin. I don't know. That's just me though. That's just the way that I operate. But listen, Carmen, I want to thank you uh, for being here tonight. And thanks again. I know that we, we continue to stack guests uh, in front of you. So you're <laughs> like, you're waiting to come out on the tonight show and you're like, Hey, Merriman, wrap it up. Uh, but it was great to talk to Sean and catch up with him. Yeah. Uh, he's great. I've, always, I've always enjoyed him and he's uh he's a, he's a pretty cool guy. And so uh, I'm glad I'm glad he put a little context to what it because I know that Bears fans were all like, "What does he mean?" I'm like, he's saying that Justin is good, but he he went out there, he was able to say his piece. I thought he said it very well. Um, but in any event, thanks to everybody who's been here this evening. Uh, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. Uh, comment using the word "sick." Follow Carmen on all her socials. Follow me, and in about an hour, I'll be on the Tape Never Lies Network, and uh, it'll be like this show, except I'll be swearing. But <laughs> so enjoy Detroit. Have a good time. So for Carmen and Sean, I'm Adam. Uh, thank you for being here. Bear down and Sammy, go ahead and play us out. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast with Adam rank on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google play and Apple podcasts brought to you by underdog fantasy.